Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're going to be having a chat with Toulouse and USA prop David Ainu shortly as well about everything from starting out in American Samoa, rugby in the USA, and of course, being part of the most successful club in European rugby. First though, Johnny, you had a good one at the weekend. You were in La Rochelle for BT, weren't you? I was, mate. Um, it was a good one. And it was a game that I did not see coming. Well, I saw yeah. the game coming, but the manner <laughs> of the game. Um, La Rochelle were pish, for one mm. in other words. Um, and Gloucester were unbelievable. So it made for a really interesting watch because I don't think anybody had seen that narrative coming. So to be there to work on it, to commentate on the game with BT was awesome. Um, and La Rochelle, who I think maybe self-admittedly saw a sort of path to the final paved with gold and that they win that game, they get a quarter at home, then they get a semi in Bordeaux, which will effectively be a home game. It would have been easy, but they essentially won that game in second gear purely because they had a scrum and a mall that overpowered Gloucester. But all the rugby, strangely, and when you go and watch La Rochelle, you're used to seeing outstanding rugby, them throwing the ball around, being organised. They... Mate, they couldn't get through phases. It was just incredible to watch. And, and Gloucester were exceptional. So La Rochelle won with a last minute try in the corner. Um, they did sort of the same against Ulster in the pool stages, you know, backed themselves, kept the ball and got over and they just did enough. But they're going to have to be a load better in the next round this weekend coming up if they're going to win at home. Um, so yeah, mate, it was a good game. Loved it because it was completely different and didn't see that coming at all. I think most people probably thought it was going to be a steamrolling, a 30, 40, 50 point win. Um, but in the end, it was tight, really tight. And Gloucester are normally renowned for them all as well in the Premiership, but they'd obviously looked at La Rochelle and thought, fuck that, we're not taking them on in that department. <laughs> <laughs> so did they kind of find a chink in the La Rochelle armour that other people will kind of now look to do the same in terms of chucking the ball about? Or was it just a case that La Rochelle was slightly off it? Do you know what? So I watched Gloucester play the week before against Newcastle as well. Um Mm. Like they're struggling in the prep, but yeah. some of what they threw together was really interesting, really well thought through. It was quite nice speaking to George Skivington pregame as well. I was like, mate, what can we expect here? And he was like, fuck knows, mate. I've given them <laughs> some of the most ridiculous star plays you've ever seen because we're going to have to do like curveballs, throw different things at them. They're massive. They've got a really solid defense. Um, and he was like, if it doesn't come off, it's my fault. We can just say afterwards that it was my fault. So, it was interesting to have that chat before and then see some of the first phase work, the star plays, the thought, the creativity um, that was all terrific going into breaking down La Rochelle's defense. And that's not going to happen every single week because those things don't come off every single week, but they did at the weekend. And then in multi-phase, it was interesting to watch them as well. It was almost how, let me talk about Scotland again, but how Scotland with 14 men, played against France at the Stade de France. So like, if you're coming off a touchline, you're playing off nine, you chuck the ball to that pot of forwards, just refuse the collision. Like, there's no point going into it because against La Rochelle, you're going to be get battered. So ball goes to that pot of forwards, they pop out of the back to 10, and 10's then got a choice. Do I play to my next pot of forwards or do I play width? And they just kept playing width. They chucked the ball over the top. Billy 12 trees with kick pass. Um, or long passing game was excellent. Um, and so there's a little bit of maybe a template that might be looked at for this week or how you play against La Rochelle. And that is there any point in getting yourself in that physical arm wrestle in the middle of the field? Probably not. Um, and that might be something that Saracens might look at this week because it's certainly worked for Gloucester at the weekend. We'll look ahead to that one a bit more later on and the quarterfinals generally. In terms of the other French teams... Montpellier couldn't have come any closer to oh, going through away extra. I mean, what do you make of that? Because a team going out on try count after extra time. It sucks, especially as an away team. Like you'd almost think of like, if it was a draw, give it to the away team because <laughs> they're coming from the south of France. The back's against the wall. They haven't really done anything in the competition. Um, I don't know, heartbreaking for them. But then also the red for Zach Mercer, which again was kind of harsh. Um by the letter of the law, yes, I understand. But even Rob Baxter come out post game and he said he thought it was harsh. But I don't know. In general, please for them in that their play is starting to click again. Um, they look more cohesive in what they're trying to do. The performance had some excellent elements to it. But to go out on that in that manner, 
is really difficult to take. But I get you've also got the player welfare. How many minutes can they play? We can't be doing stupid things and playing golden goal, golden try in rugby and the boys out there for two and a half hours. You have to end up some point. Yeah. You could do, um, which I, I love watching as well. Absolute drama. Uh, but to go out in that manner and that way um, with a few decisions that didn't go their way as well during the game, which made it more difficult for them, uh, a tough one to swallow, definitely. And to lose, of course, saw off the balls, three tries in a 15-minute period in that second half. Other than that, it was fairly even, but they did what they had to do. It was fairly even, but Toulouse have got this ability just to dig deep and create and generate things when other teams don't. Um, that is it's what you expect from La Rochelle. It's what everyone was expecting at the weekend, but it didn't quite happen. But Toulouse have got that blend of being able to hang, in, hang into a game, physically stay there, the static phases, they're all there. And then there's a little bit of X factor. There's a three on two created from the base of a scrum. There's the pace to finish it. Um, they just have that little bit extra to get over the try line. Let's get our guest on now then, and we can have a chat with a USA international who's loving life at Toulouse at the moment. Prop David Ainu joins us. How are you doing? No, it's doing good. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Talk us through that win at the weekend then, because it's a bit different facing the South African side, isn't it? So how are the Bulls? It's definitely a different different game, different beast when you play against the South African teams. It's, you know, it's, it's aggressive. They're aggressive, quick, and um, extremely physical. So, you know, having a battle them you know it wasn't there wasn't a moment in the game where we could just let off it's right when the whistle blew to to start the game until the end it was you know it was definitely a fight so you know the those those south african teams and you know we've got another one lined up you know they're definitely a, a lot to handle and a lot to prepare for so they're annoying aren't they <laughs> <laughs> no, they you know they, they, they got the way man you know it's i think it's a it's a good uh it's a good experience for the French boys to see how how they do it down in the uh, down in South Africa, even for myself as well. It's uh, yeah, it's, like I said, it's a whole nother, a whole another ball game, a different beast playing those teams. What have you made of the debrief? I'm guessing you've been in today. You're currently in the Austria room. We can see behind you. We'll see Jerome, Kaino yeah. probably hobbling in to see his <laughs> his visit with a chiropractor any minute. But you'll have had the debrief with the coaches. What did you make of that win of the Bulls? Because it was tough, right? You had to hang in, and there were some key moments that swayed that game but what did Ugo Mola what did the coaches say in the, in the debrief and the messages that came across for this weekend's game yeah we, we haven't had the, the the collective brief yet but just going through like our our split session you know um uh, a lot of it is just the the little details um like uh, our lineouts you know cleaning up our lineouts and and our set pieces um you know going against uh you know the Bulls and in, in this coming week the the Sharks you know the set piece is a, is a massive part of the game it always has been. It always will be. But you know, a lot of those, um, a lot of those moments, uh, could be the difference for us. Uh, whether we score a try or we're backpedaling, you know, seventy, you know, seventy meters. And you might not have gone to the preview yet, but are there are there differences between the Bulls and the Sharks? You reckon? Obviously, we know generally how South African sides play, but are there any kind of key differences? Uh, uh what we've what we've seen so far, like they're they're, they're very similar. They're just extremely collective, extremely aggressive and physical uh, i i think i think we're gonna we're gonna get the same images uh in terms of physicality and and how they play uh this week um so i think for us it's of course getting prepared for for the uh you know the technical stuff but also being physically prepared for you know for that matchup that's coming again this week um so i think for me that's that's the biggest um uh similarities between the two teams is the, the aggressiveness and the physicality both teams bring. Basically, bar up, Johnny. Be ready for a bow. Just tip that <laughs> ball on to the next man. Give it to Manny Miyafu. He can carry. That's yeah. all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, he's, yeah, trust me. That's the yeah, spearheading the, the physicality, man. <laughs> Let's move away from the games a bit now and chat about you because you've got an interesting yeah. pathway. And going right back to the start, you were born in American Samoa, weren't you? So when did you move over to the States and how did you get into rugby? Yeah, so I was born in American Samoa, and um, uh, we moved to the states. Like I think when I was two, we moved to California. Lived in, in California for a bit, and then um, my dad got a job uh, up in Seattle, uh, Washington State, just just below Canada. And um, I, I I didn't play any rugby up until this point. Like in my mind, rugby was like the most inferior sport ever. I thought it sucked. Like as an American boy, I, like I only wanted to play. American football. I was gonna go to the NFL. Like that was my thing. Um, so when I when I got to Seattle, um, my brothers and my cousins started playing, and uh, my mom tried to force me to play. And I was like, No, I'm not. I'm not playing. Like, 
like I'm all about the pads, I'm all about the you know the the, the helmets and stuff like that. And um, she's like, well, you don't have a choice. As long as you live under my roof, you're gonna tell you're gonna do what I tell you. So um, <laughs> she, what she mom. Me out I like and, it, mom. Um, yeah, she she told me like you're you're gonna go support your brothers and like while you're there you're gonna make use of yourself. So I, I ran water. I was a water boy for for my brother's team um, when I first started out. I and, thought um, you looked a little I, bit I like Adam year. Sandler. I was sure there was a bit of Adam Sandler <laughs> in there somewhere. This is great. Hey man, I'm just dishing out high quality H2O, man. That's, that's, my, that's, my, that's my inspiration, man. <laughs> Well, yeah. So I, I started. I started as a water boy, and then the next year, my mom was like, "Well, you have no choice. Like you've already been there, so you're gonna you're gonna sign up." So signed up, and you know, just just started playing, and I loved it. At that point, my my mentality focused. I hated American football. I didn't want to play it anymore. Uh, I, I thought it was the the most inferior sport, <laughs> and and you know, I just stuck with the rugby ever since. And what age was that, mate? What age was the transition and being forced by your mom to start carrying the water and getting involved? When I was when I was I think thirteen or fourteen, so I, I came in I came into the sport pretty late um, uh, at that time. But yeah, I, I played American football the you know when I was I think I started at seven or eight and just kept playing ever since. Um, and then once thirteen hit, once I once I started playing that, I was doing both at the same time. Uh, but ultimately, just, just stuck with the rugby after that. But yeah, fourteen years old was when i when i first picked up a rugby ball johnny you were probably fully entrenched in some sort of scottish academy by the time you were 14 when you may i just dropped out of football i was soccer for david i was soccer as a youth and then cricket mm. and all sorts of stuff um and yeah 14 i think is when it started to get serious i guess that's the time that you actually start looking towards representative rugby so for my age group it was under 16s was the first bracket and then then it's like you're on a treadmill. You've got no choice. And the next minute you're sent on a boat and you're inside the France playing for Toulouse. That's how it all, it all happens. But it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely, uh, yeah, I definitely didn't see um, the pathway. Like in, in America, there isn't really a pathway uh, to make it into professional rugby overseas. So yeah, 14, I didn't think that I would even be here, um, you know, let alone be playing a, a sport that um, isn't that big in America to begin with. And when you started doing well at rugby in the states were people then trying to convince you to go back to american football yeah yeah so it's, a very, it's an interesting dynamic in, in america like uh very prideful very i mean closed off like everyone just wants you to play your american sports your basketball your football your you know your, your baseball and once i once i decided that that wasn't my pathway like there is definitely like a a shift in in the way that coaches and and you know football coaches really look at rugby players, you know, because uh, you know they see that the, the this player is developing in another sport. Like, why can't he just stick with American football? You know, you can benefit from that. You know, so it's right there. I think that's kind of like it's hard for a lot of American football players to to make that decision. I mean, once the the obviously you know the contract stuff and you know just seeing where you could go in that, but. You know, you're getting pulled every which way when you're playing rugby and in, in, in American football in the states. You, it's it's hard to make that decision, and uh, you know, it's it's hard for an American rugby player to to take that step because one, it's unknown, and there's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of uh, guidance in, in America for for rugby. But you've certainly taken that step, and and look at you now. So, give us the building blocks and the steps that you took. So, from that 14 year old starting to play, carrying the water, getting involved and excelling the sport to landing in France on a professional contract. What did that pathway look like for you? Oh, I, you know, like, I think for me, it just, I think everything fit perfectly into place. Like, I honestly believe, like, the stars were aligned for something like that to happen. Um, yeah, so I, I started I started playing and um, I got picked up for a rep side in Washington. Uh, played that for a couple of years and then I got asked to join... Um, the high school Americans would be the like the underage uh, USA team. Um, so I did under 16s um, for USA and we we traveled to we came to France. We, we played against uh, a lot of the boys that I'm playing with now, like Roman and uh, like Danny, Brennan, all those guys like they were a part of that team that we played against. Um, fast forward, like. You know, I'm in high school. I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing uh, USA rep stuff. We're going to Canada. We're playing Canada every year. Um, and then after that, I just, I, I didn't really know what my pathway was going to be after that. 
I was deciding if I wanted to go to school or focus on the rugby. And um, I signed with the college team. Uh, but two days later, I just called up the coach and said, hey, mate, like, I, I can't, I can't come. Like, I, I need to do something else. I don't want to, I don't want to give up the, the rugby career and, you know, have to split my, my, my time with school and rugby. And he definitely wasn't a happy camper about that, but he respected it. And somehow that caught wind. Got called by an agent and he basically asked me where I wanted to go. And for some reason I said France. Like there was, there was no, there's no reason as to why I chose it. It was just the first thing that came to mind. Um, basically let me know, like, what are, you, what are your three teams? I said Toulouse, because at the time my favorite player was uh, Sensei Johnson. Legend. Um, I, I looked up to that guy, like, growing and, and playing rugby. Yeah, <laughs> playing uh, playing rugby. Um, so I said Toulouse, Toulon, and Perpignan. And uh, he shot it straight to me. He said, listen, like, I know you're, you're tenacity, but I'm going to be real. Like, there's absolutely no chance that you're going to get into these academies. You're not – nobody knows who you are. You come from the States. You play prop like there's, you know, France has a whole bunch of props. And uh, two months later, actually, um, Emil Entomac uh, reached out and was like, yeah, I actually do remember David playing against my son like seven years ago. Uh, we'll take him in. We'll, we'll give him a chance here at the, at the academy. And uh, six months has turned into six years. So, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely like I said, it definitely hasn't been like a, a traditional route. And a lot of luck and a lot of stars had to be aligned for me to get here. But um, it's, it's, it's possible and it has been possible. So. Not a traditional route. Johnny, it's like the script of a movie. We'll call Adam Sandler. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's amazing. It's so cool. But then obviously you've done enough in that youth game to leave an impression with your physicality and your physical presence that you obviously still have now and the technical abilities to prop up and have an impact at scrum. So a pipe dream to so many, but it just shows that even in a rep game at that level, if you apply yourself and you do a decent job when you've got coaches and, and and people doing a job of the scouting which emil was at that time you get that shot it's incredible like i don't know how many people would have that opportunity based on one game but it just shows it's absolutely incredible and these things can happen you can end up at one of the biggest clubs in the world and kill it it's so cool and also kids dream big like wh which clubs oh. are you looking at in france oh to lose the biggest the biggest ones <laughs> yeah oh I'm not even going to lie to you guys. Like, I didn't know anything about Toulouse until I got to Toulouse. Like, I was like, Toulouse, like, even the, even the city, like, I heard South of France, like, oh, it's going to be warm. Like, I, I didn't pack any, like, like, warm clothes, got here completely rainy. I think I got, like, a flu the first day that I got here. But even <laughs> to, like, even the team, like, I didn't, I didn't know about all the accolades. I didn't know. I had no clue what European Cup was, like. To me, I just I just wanted to come play here because my favorite player played here. Like, <laughs> so I definitely like yeah, just a odd chance that I, I managed to be at you know one of the, the top clubs here. And um, but yeah, like like I said, I, I it, like an American kid coming to you know to Europe, like no clue. I mean, when you arrived, you mentioned Census, who, who's a good <laughs> mate as well. Being there, was I can't remember if Census was still at the club or if he'd left for Racing, but was he still there when you arrived at the club? No, he. So when I got there, he just left. He just left Racing. Um, but there's been, yeah, I've seen him. He was. I think we played the the first game that I I watched was Racing at at home here in here in here in Toulouse. So, like actually sitting down, I think after that game we sat and had a meal and like I was I was starstruck. Like this is the guy that I used to watch on YouTube like kicking grubbers on international level and like now i'm having an, an entre coat with this guy you know what i mean so it's uh yeah it was, it was definitely an experience meeting meeting my idol and, and uh you know just sharing a meal and just picking his brains about everything so and they also say generally you shouldn't meet your heroes because they end up being dicks but how good a guy is census like to have a hero and then to meet a guy like census he's one of the best guys isn't he once I met him, like, I was like, I'm glad that I look up to someone like this because, uh, you know, the on-field stuff, like, is great. He's a great dude. He's an amazing player. But the off-field stuff, like, I haven't had a lot of interactions with him. But the one time that I have, like, like that's that's the person that I, like, I, I'm happy to look up to because he's such a, a hardworking guy. And, you know, what he's done in his career and his um, and the work that he's done for Toulouse and, and French rugby, like, it's it's definitely something that um, I hope to be and, 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 like, try to do my best to be one day. but. Yeah, amazing dude. And you also mentioned not really knowing genuinely too much about the club when you arrived. Could that be considered almost a good thing in that for some people arriving 
at one of the world's most successful clubs with decorated players to a young guy could be quite daunting. But actually not knowing too much and coming in eyes wide open, did you just take it all in and, and get on with it? Or how did it work? Yeah, no, I think it, it was a blessing in disguise that I had no clue who Toulouse was. Like for me, yeah, I think I would have it would have made me uh, a little bit more stressed in the way that I went about my progression here. Like, because there are so many like unreal players, and I think for me, I, I would have gotten in my head, um, like, I'm not at the caliber of these boys. I'm not at the caliber of like Cyril Bai or Dorian Aldeguri or Charlie Fomwe. You know, like. I, I definitely think like not knowing what I was getting myself into kind of like helped me progress in a way that um, that made it easier for me to to, to stay at the club and um, just focus on my progression. Um, because yeah, I think I think I would have <laughs> yeah I, I would have been all over the place if if I knew what what who Toulouse was and and what you know what they've done and and the players and the caliber of, of uh, coaching and players that were here. And you played against. Roman Entomat, you said, before you moved to the club. He's obviously the same age as you. So when you arrived, were you in the mix with him with the Espoirs or was he already big man on campus by that point with the first team? Yeah, so when I came, he was, I think he was bouncing back and forth between the the, the Espoirs and, and the top team. But I'll tell you, like, I think the first game that I, I played, or maybe I think it was a few games later, um, Roman came down and was playing Espoir. I've never seen so many people come and watch an S4 game solely for the fact that Roman Entomac was playing. I was like, I was like, damn, like this is this is how it is. And then um yeah, I just remember talking to someone and uh, they're like, oh it's because Roman's starting at 10 for us. There's that a lot of people want to come see him play. I was like, okay. Yeah, that's he's he's big dog now. He's he's my age, but he's definitely he's top dog at this club now. <laughs> and what's he like as a personality? Because when you look around the other Six Nations countries and you see Johnny Sexton's and Owen Farrell's kind of barking and growling. He doesn't seem like that type of character. He seems more relaxed on the field. But what's he like away from the field when he's relaxed? No, I think the, his his demeanor on the field like emulates what he is off the field. He's just he's just a relaxed guy. Like there's he, he's just he's cool with everyone. Like and I think in in general with our team, but you know with specifically with Roman, like he he gets along with everyone. There's he's just he's very lax in the way that he goes about his his ways and he's quiet like. You know, he, he's a, he's a man of, of of a few words, but his actions and 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 the the way that he does things like speaks the volume. Um, you know, the way that he composes himself and and the way that he goes about the club. Like, yeah, for for someone, it's crazy to think like him and I are basically the same age. Like, he's so mature and like just just so like um, just calm and and he's got this like unreal like almost wise old wise guy demeanor to him, which is unreal for someone that young. And especially you mentioned that there's this big crowd came to just watch him play an Espoir game that wouldn't have been there for any other Espoir game. So obviously people have known about him from such an early age that that can surely give you a big head. But it seems like all the superstars at Toulouse are generally quite grounded. They're quite down to earth. So Mm. give us a sense of what he's like. What's he what's he into does he like a drink he's just generally kind of normal bloke yeah i think you know this this goes along with all, you know all the french international guys like i think they they do a really good job at like um you know taking the stuff that's on the field um and leaving it on the field and then when it comes time to like hang out with the boys i'll hang out with the boys like you know they're they're professional and uh you know they're they're serious when they're when it's when it's merited but when it comes to you know enjoying the the culture and enjoying the the company of the boys like yeah they take full advantage of it because you know at the end of the day they're you know the the guys just like us and they they understand that and i think for them like you know them accepting that and understanding that that uh that sort of mentality just allows them in turn to like deal with with the the pressure of being the best of the best you know you know, finding that escape and finding that ability to switch it on and off when they when they need to, um, you know, that's a tough job. And every single one of them do a really good job at, at managing that and and uh, going about life that way. You mentioned a little bit earlier as well how you didn't feel like you're in the same bracket as Charlie Famaina, Cyril Bai, Marchand, these guys, but clearly you are. Like you're 23 years old, buckets of game time, clearly getting better and better as well. 
what is it like being part of that group as a front row club, learning with them some of the best in Europe, if not the world, and aspiring to be at their level consistently every single day and taking that form when you go and play for your country? Um, what is that experience like? It's made my game jump leaps and bounds, especially at the international level. Like every every training, every opportunity that I have to like work with these boys, like I, I honestly, I, I'm just a sponge. Like I could sit and talk with Cyril Bai about how to become a better loose head and like going against the you know the Tad Furlongs of the world and like understanding like how he goes about scrums and and seeing how I can be better at my you know at my craft. Like it's it's just been. I I don't I I don't think I would I would be where I'm at now if it wasn't for these guys like being able to just coach me, you know. Uh, as much as they're players, like you know, to, in my eyes, they're they're more than just players. They're coaches, you know. They they've they've helped me increase my game to a level that that has been able to benefit the team um, and allowed me to play the the amount of games that I've had, you know. And, and Charlie as well, like. Uh, days like hours of just sitting and talking with charlie about scrums you know like how how do i set up what's the what's the perfect bind like all of this stuff is is yeah there's no there's no value to the to the experience and the knowledge these guys have have given me over the years and continue to give me even to this day so it's definitely been a an unreal experience and a blessing to just just rub shoulders with you guys and you know understand where their mind is as they play these games and johnny mentioned him earlier on in terms of the fact that he might need a extra massage or two nowadays now he's reached a, a ripe old age but we've got to ask you about co-host of the podcast jerome kano because oh, yeah. not, on, not only is he obviously your coach and we want to know all the gossip about what he's like as a as a coach but also he was born in american samoa too wasn't he so is that created sort of an extra bond with you guys you know I, I didn't know I didn't know uh, Jerome Kano was born in American Samoa until I actually talked to him when I first came here. I was like I I forgot which vo- village he's in, but it, it, I don't think it's too far from where I was born. But yeah, no, like understanding that now, like it's just it's I guess for me it's been interesting to see like uh, you know the the pathways that we've both taken in our careers. Like he's born in American Samoa, but ends up going to New Zealand playing for the All Blacks. Like I go to America, you know, and getting there and finding a way over here, you know, just just understand like this the weird collective like finding getting back to each other kind of thing. Um, definitely look up to him, like I always do. Like he's he's such an unreal character. Like and to know that he comes from the same place that I, you know, I was born is uh, is is pretty interesting. You know, like it's uh it's hard to really comprehend like. Uh, what what he's done and 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 his career and uh, just seeing what it what he's is continuing to do as a coach, um, but every once in a while we'll just pull out the American passports and be like, yeah, we're we're American. Like <laughs> <laughs> him and I just sharing, like, yeah, we're we're American. Yeah, we we got that American passport. We got that eagle. And mate, American Samoa. Correct me if I'm wrong. A population of what between forty fifty thousand. I I haven't I haven't looked at it, but I think you might be right. It's it's a uh, yeah, it's a very small place. Around that ballpark, but a factory for athletes, right? If you look at the NFL, you look at you guys, what you're doing in rugby, how much or how seriously is rugby taken on American Samoa? How many people play it there purely? I don't think it's really played at all. I think we like we have like there is an American Samoa national team, but it's it's not serious. Like if you go through the the high schools and the and the school grades, what they're they're teaching players to play American football. Like that's the that's the ticket out. That's the, you know, that's the real money maker. So I don't think there's a lot of, there's a lot of schools that really, you know, attain to, to rugby because it's not, uh, you know, a lot of those players, they don't really look, uh, a lot of those students, a lot of those athletes don't really look to, to go to New Zealand and, and, you know, play that way. You know, all we know is NFL and the contracts. Like that's, that's what motivates a lot of those players is to get off the Island and, and go to to the U.S. and you know hopefully you know have a have a good stint in college football and one day make the NFL. So yeah, the rugby game's not big. And on the international rugby front, we've got to ask you about that. We'll start with a negative, but I promise we'll become more positive after that. We've got to take us back to I was November. For this. <laughs> <laughs> You're prepped. You're ready. It's okay. It's interesting. It, like just from the 
the very face of it, in Dubai, a game between the USA and Portugal already sounds quite random. You draw the game 16 all, and then they qualify for the World Cup on points difference. It, it, the whole thing is is fairly mad, but just talk us through what it was like for for you and obviously the disappointment. Oh, you know, I, I think for me, like given, you know, even leading up to Dubai where we, you know, we played, we played Uruguay in Uruguay. We, we lost that opportunity. We played Chile at home. We lost that opportunity, like heading into Dubai. Like it was just a very, just so much pressure on uh on on myself and i'm sure amongst the boys because you know for us we knew like this is it like you know the other two opportunities like we 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 knew in our heads that like oh if we if we must it against uruguay at least we'll have chile and we must both opportunities and now we're you know we're at the you know at the end of the road like it's it's either do or die so i think that it was unspoken but i think everyone was really feeling that pressure and uh going into um going into that that tournament it was it was tough and how big a blow is that like losing that game and the usa now missing out on the world cup in france which would have been huge for you how big a blow is that to rugby in the country oh man i i think i think for me like it just it just feels um no, I, I think for, like it, it felt like i let like i think the and the, the group of us kind of let down the, you know, the organization and, and, and I guess USA rugby in general. So no, it was, it was definitely a big blow. Like I think for a lot of us, um, like I said, like we, I've, I felt like we, we failed the program. We failed USA rugby because, you know, we have so many boys that are, you know, with the introduction of MLR and the boys that are over here overseas, like, um, you know, we, we put in the work, uh, to hopefully join up as a team and and be able to qualify, but having missed out on three opportunities, like it, yeah, definitely, it was it was like a um, you know, a knife to the heart to to see you know Portugal you know hold that qualified you know banner, you know because as as much as it did you know didn't show um, you know the, the the past three times that we tried to qualify like. Everyone, everyone sacrificed a lot to be there and, and try to get the team on, you know, on the world stage in France. You know, a lot of boys missing out on, uh, you know, births of their children or, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, income that they could have made to, to be on this team and to, to push us through, you know, to, to see the boys, um, you know, for me to see them not uh, be rewarded uh, with that opportunity to play in a, in a World Cup. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely took a it took a big blow to to myself and and the team as a whole. So let's look ahead and turn that into a positive then, because obviously we know the USA is hosting the World Cup in 2031. Which 2031, I mean, that sounds like so far in the future. But you're so young that you will probably, hopefully, still be playing at that point. Johnny and I will be about 60 or something. But exactly. you'll yeah. you'll only be 31 <laughs> if my maths is right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Yeah, no, hopefully, hopefully I'm still on that team, man. <laughs> so obviously that is huge for the sport. And in a weird way, not qualifying now has to be a line in the sand, doesn't it? It has to be kind of right, what can we do? You, you got what is it, 2031, you got eight years to to prepare, focus, put things in place. Obviously, you just concentrate on playing the best rugby you can mm -hmm. and you're in the, the perfect place to do that and to lose. But give us a sense of the potential that's in the USA and, and what you think needs to be done? Let's see, where do I start? Um, if you had the answer to that question, not only would you be playing amazing rugby at Toulouse, you'd probably be a millionaire as well. Like we're, we're already at the, in terms of like our confidence and, and where we're at as a team, like we're at the bottom. We're at the, like, there's only, there's only going up from here. You know, it's, um, I think for us, it's understand, like being, being true and, and, being honest with ourselves on what's what we really need to do as a team um, and what has to be done um, in the interest of the progression of USA rugby and the progression of the team. Um, if, if that means, you know, letting go of players, myself included, like if I'm not bringing any benefit to the team, then let me go like that, you know, like that's just, I think for us, it's the mindset of us just not being on the team, like just to play the game, but to grow the game. And sometimes you have to grow the game with some people not being there or, you know, moving on, whether that be in the office or the 
players on the field um, to, to get the best out of boys. You know, um, I, I don't I don't want us to feel like we uh, like the organization owes anything to players or staff uh, because they've been in the program for so long. I think that times that's kind of sailed. You know, we just at this point, it's just progress. And if, you know, you're either with the progress or you're not, um, you know, but building into that World Cup, like uh, my aim is to to hopefully get the team to a place where we are competitive um, on, on those big stages. You know, we're not just barely qualifying or we're, you know, we're just showing up. Like I, I really want us to, in the future, put on a team that is battling, the, you know, the world's greatest, you know, in, in front of our home crowd. You know, because it's um, I, I think at, at that point like that, that just shows that all the work that we're doing now is really coming into fruition, you know, in 2031. And do you think more talent should be brought over from American football or do you think that's not the right pathway? Do you think you need more kind of international like top coaches to kind of over the course of the eight years to kind of develop and more money invested like what what's i mean i know these are all very difficult questions but there are a number of different routes you can go down aren't there it's just interesting to see yeah no i i think i think it's a, it's a mixture of everything i think i think starting with the the introduction of the game in usa like it being more uh you know more announced that like we do have rugby in the states and changing the mindset of american football players like this is a pathway that you can take too. Like it's it's not just American football. You, if you don't make it, you're done. You know, you you have another opportunity in this sport to to play at the highest level. So I think step one is is changing the mindset of coaches, players, and society in sports that like it's not just these sports that you can be successful in. You can be successful here. Um, I think when it comes to uh, player development, uh, probably getting them overseas. You know you. As much as like Americans are very prideful to keep the players homegrown and like develop their game to give to American, you know, to, to the USA team, I think the real growth is being able to play overseas and, you know, rub shoulders with the best. Because, you know, you, you, you're going to have to be your best every time, you know, when you're playing overseas because that's all that's around. Um, and then, you know, eventually coming back or, you know, joining the the Eagles and, and playing and sharing that knowledge there and just, uh, you know, being able to, to dish it off to everyone else that who aren't, you know, that haven't had the opportunity to come overseas, but understand um, what the expectation and what the level of the game is um, through these players that they know. Um, when it comes to coaching, I think, you know, uh, for me, like, I, I, I haven't really had a lot of experiences of, of coaches in the States, but having coaches that are, you know, international coaches, like I've only, I feel like my game has only benefited. So I think having more coaches um, that are international that have played their game outside of the U S um, taking the time and, and investing uh, their, the abilities and their experience into the game in the States, I think will benefit it in the long run. Um, I think I, I, you know, I don't blame, I don't blame coaches. I don't blame, co you know, players to not seeing like the, the long, the long-term goal of American rugby if, if they came over, but uh, it, you know, everything will make a difference in due time. You know, it's hard to see it now, especially with the state of, you know, USA rugby and, you know, being out of the world cup. But um, if someone really believed it and um, really feel like they can impact the game, then, you know, staying for X amount of years to try to develop the game is, is really a drop in a bucket. You know, it, it will pay off eventually. And, you know, hopefully that's, you know, in the next, you know, the, the World Cup that happens in the States. So that's eight years looking ahead. And what would you yeah. say, if you looked at the true potential, so like having grown up and gone through systems in Seattle, having seen the physical potential of all the athletes, be them Polynesian or the kids that are striving to try and get into the NFL or the NBA, like hundreds of thousands of top level athletes, some of them you've seen transition out, um, not make the NFL, but come in to rugby late, which is always more difficult. But what do you see as the true potential for American rugby? Like you've got a population base, you've got a massive economy that could fund the MLR properly. If USA rugby is funded properly as well, with a top level program and everything streamlined, surely American rugby could sit at the top table 
in terms of you know top 10 nations in the world given the population the strengths that you have no i i think that's the game that's the that's the i mean that's the pinnacle of, of usa rugby at this point it's it's being able to have all these things like we, we we have we have the ingredients we have the athletes we have you know the the ability to, to put a team together i think it's just adding all these other things to to create the final product and you know um yeah, I, th- I think it, yeah, I, like I said, I think it really comes down to getting everything in the right place um, and at the right time to be able to develop these players um, at home and allow them to to progress and whether they make themselves overseas or stay home, but to continue to progress to become you know international level great players. Um, yeah, it's it's all there. It's all there. It's just it's all got to just piece itself together one way or another and like we we, yeah we have eight years to do it so (laughs) as somebody that's come through the system you mentioned that you were forced into age 13 14 into a sport and you've seen the infrastructures and the systems that allowed you to get to international rugby and that allowed you to also come over here and get a place in Toulouse but have you noticed looking back now a difference or improvement in that funnel in the way that things are structured and organized to allow the next generation to flourish or is it still kind of the same um, you know, I haven't I haven't looked back into it, um, but I, for me, the the way that I you know I still I still look back at um, you know USA great stuff and, and you know I keep I keep a tab on things. Um, I think it's it's progressing, but it it's progressing very slowly. Um, I don't know where I don't know where and how it needs to to just take that another level to to be able to be. Um, you know, a solid platform for young young rugby players to to see the game as a viable option for them because uh, you know I, I think it's at the moment it's just kind of just a a label for players like it's um uh, I played for USA you know like that's at this point like that's in in my opinion that's where it's kind of gone um, and has gone but is trying to like get away from to from being just a label but you know um. Uh, you know, something to to really be proud of. I think um, they're making their way there, but it definitely has to it has to turn it up a notch. There has to be more more done to the to those age grade levels in order for for real progression to really flourish um, on those players coming overseas or or being viable options um, on the on the international level for the for the senior squad. And going back to talking about athletes' success and the top top level, we have to ask you about Antoine Dupont. We've talked about Roman Entomac. We know all these guys are quite grounded, down to earth. They're really great guys. I want to ask you slightly from an mm-hmm. American perspective as well. Obviously, Antoine was named Six Nations Player of the Championship third time in four years last week. Is he embracing his role as a global superstar of the sport or not so much? Because we've seen him in his dressing gown on GQ, which was brilliant, loved it. But you'll be used to... <laughs> like. LeBron James, Patrick Mahomes, guys who are, they're put up there on that pedestal, but then they sort of have to embrace it. And they know that they're the figurehead of the sport. And in rugby, quite often that doesn't happen. We've had Dan Carter, we've had other players, but generally there isn't a guy put up there. And surely that helps sell the sport. So Antoine's that guy, isn't he? No, 100%. Like, I forgot where I was watching this. You know, in in rugby, you know, as long as I've played the sport, there's very few guys that are that, that are the image of rugby. And this guy is that, you know, I, he, he fits the role perfectly. Like, um, and, and the way that he, he goes about it, like he takes it, he, he, he makes the situation work for him. He doesn't work for the situation. Like he's, he's definitely the, the guy to, to push the sport internationally because, uh, like his unreal, like on the field stuff, like unreal, like you don't see it anywhere else. You know, you don't have to you don't have to love rugby or know rugby to to understand freak, you know, you know, vision and, and, and abilities. And that's that's what he has. And I think, you know, that will bring a lot of people to the sport just to see, like, how does this how does this guy do what he you know, how, how does he do what he, he does, uh, you know, week in, week out? Um, and then even on the off field stuff, like, yeah, like. I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, cut it short. He's, he's a great looking guy. Like he's gonna, 
he's gonna pull in everyone from everywhere just you know just the way that he looks you know so he's he's definitely that that guy to to bring rugby especially in the states onto a, a mainstream platform and uh, bringing a lot of a lot of eyes um, simply by the way that he plays and the way he goes about his uh, his business. Given he is quite shy and grounded, from an American perspective, do we as a sport need to help him to kind of market himself? And that's the way we kind of grow the game as well. Because you could show him videos of all sorts of American superstars and be mm. like, "I know you you dress again in GQ is great, Antoine, but come on, this is like, do we need to sort of do Antoine Dupont documentaries and uh, do we need to sort of sell the game?" <laughs> I, you know i think uh, maybe but i think he i think he himself and i think the sport in and of itself will sell will sell the game and and sell the image that he's trying to portray because like you know his image and the sport of rugby especially like they, they go hand in hand you know so i i think i think it will i think it will promote itself the longer that he he holds that position and continues to thrive in that position because it, it definitely won't go unnoticed. You know, Americans love accolades, you know, Super Bowl champ, this, this, and that, you know, you keep that, you know, eventually people will hear Six Nations, uh, you know, top player, you know, the world, you know, former best, you know, best rugby player in the world. Like, you know, people will continue to to gravitate towards those things and, and that will open that that venue for, for American supporters and supporters in general to be like, hey, like this guy's great, but this sport's even, you know, this 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 sport's a different beast and uh, definitely something to keep an eye to. Absolutely, and you'll be right in that bracket as well, David. Look, forget Antoine, yes. you'll be you'll be on a yes. billboard in Times Square leading up to yeah. 2031. I don't know. I might be the ones putting up the billboards. We'll see. We'll see where my career, we'll see where my career goes, man. <laughs> really awesome to chat. I don't know why I'm saying awesome to chat as if I've turned American now, but. <laughs> Awesome. Great to chat. Great to chat, David. Brilliant hearing about your career. And um, we look forward to watching in the lead up to 2031 as well. Thank you for having me. And good luck this weekend, mate. All the best. We'll try, we'll try our best. <laughs> we will try our best. Cheers, mate. Thank you very much. We didn't really chat European rugby that much there, Johnny, but arguably more interesting talking to David about American rugby and what should and couldn't happen. And apologies to Antoine Dupont for suggesting that he should do more than just put a dressing gown on and appear on the front of GQ, but you know, be more LeBron maybe. I just loved how you went all American towards the end of the conversation. <laughs> you threw out that awesome, man. It's awesome <laughs> to speak to you, Dave. I'm embracing um, it. And so should Antoine. Mate, great guy. Amazing story as well. Like what are the chances of that? And that one game in your touring side away, getting picked up by Emil Intermac and joining the freaking yeah. biggest club in the world. I mean, incredible stuff, but He's good. Like he's a mm. good prop. He scrums well. Like he mentioned there, he's in a setup where he gets to exchange with Charlie Famaina. Like who else are you going to learn from? One of the world's best tight head props. Um, probably one of the best of all time. So look, amazing. His story is absolutely amazing. Hopefully he's the first of a raft of players that can come over and play professionally in Europe or further afield. Super rugby. We've seen Todd Cleaver as well. Um looking like Hercules being phenomenal from the back row as well. But look, the more the merrier. Um, and America produces so many athletes, but it's just can they produce a raft of them at the same time that capture an imagination and then get another generation involved and that just becomes cyclical? That is the barrier they have to break down where they have such big traditional sports that hold so much attention. So amazing to have him on. Um, great story. He's doing one hell of a job as well when called upon with Toulouse. And yeah, you mentioned Antoine Dupont, but like Antoine Dupont in France, like the size of the country in the rugby market, if you add America to the rugby avid market and they start to follow it, you double it. Like that's the scary thing is that America's what, 330 million people? Um, so yeah, look, it's incredible. I just hope that through the MLR that that sticks, that they reduce a little bit the foreigners they have in the league, that there's more American talent coming through that there are foundations in place to try and get that conveyor belt of talent um, pushing through so that the American team can flourish because it would be exceptional. Imagine you had the American team in 2031. David, obviously the captain by then, Captain America, president as well, <laughs> um, flying and performing in front of a home crowd, just how much that would do 
to get people on board and get rugby in America flying. So mate, great to have him on. Great guy. And I love that you are now Tim Groves, the American <laughs> hero. That was the best bit. Right. It's about time we found out what your meter moment of the week is, Johnny. Well, it doesn't come from European rugby. This might disappoint some people. Um, there were some elements. It was a great header at the sevens at the weekend. You probably saw that. There was a couple of decent finishes in Champions Cup rugby and in Challenge Cup rugby, but it actually comes from Pro De Deux and a young pup, a boy called Leo Banos. We'll share it on our social media pages as well. But Leo Banos uh, and Mono Marsan, who is part of the under 20s crop, he's a really decent back rower, good line out forward as well, but showed some unbelievable footballing skills at the weekend. Willie Duplessis, they're playing against Colombia away from home. And this effectively wins them the game. Willie Duplessis sticks up and up and under. The ball's going out. Everyone's left it. Leo Banos calmly, coolly sticks it on the toe, drops it back into play, controls it with his outside of his right foot, nudges it two more times and dots down under the post. And it is absolutely incredible to watch. So if you haven't seen it, YouTube yourself, Leo Banos. We'll stick it on our Instagram page or wherever it goes. Is it you to do that too? Yeah, you'll do that too. You're much more technical than I am. <laughs> Um, but Leo Banos, who's on his way to Toulouse as well, I think. Um, of he's he a ta- talented boy. So he'll be joining Dave and the boys at Toulouse. Um, but that is clearly the meter moment of the week. When you see it, you'll understand it. Controlling an up and under on the outside of his foot, scoring a try of absolutely nothing and winning away from home at Colombia in Pro De Deux. Definitely check out the clip because... I've described it really badly. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> it was well described, but it's even better when you see it. And you can see him looking over his shoulder you can see him pick the ball out follow it the whole way it's, drops it's onto class. his toe it's it's messy-esque you gotta watch it it's brilliant that was johnny's meter moment of the week and meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless bluetooth meat probe you can use it on a barbecue in the oven or in a pan and you can get your hands on one at meter.com plus you can get 10 percent off any full price item all you have to do is enter the code FrenchPod10 at checkout. That's FrenchPod10, and you get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. Let's look ahead to the Champions Cup quarterfinals now, Johnny. We spoke a little bit about Toulouse Sharks, but not in massive depth with David. So what are you expecting? I don't know what to expect from the Sharks. Um, all that I kind of do, and I've got a lot of mates that have played there, and they are super hard working super hard physically i think they're traveling this morning so we're recording this on tuesday i think they have four flights they're split into two groups uh all in cattle class knees up around your armpits absolute shit show so the travel over here is going to be horrendous they're not going to have much prep but they're a talented hard-working gritty brunch um and i reckon that's going to be a really tough game um for toulouse who haven't played against them before, having watched the Sharks in the URC this year as well, um, they're a serious outfit. Um, so Sia Khaleesi and those boys coming to town, I don't think Etzebeth is going to be fit. It looks like he's a doubt, but he's still travelling. That all being said, it's Toulouse at home. We saw last weekend, they've got a way of digging themselves out of these situations. The fundamentals of the game are still very good, but they've got that little sprinkle of X factor and moments where they just sparkle. So, I think Toulouse will get through that one with a win. Um, I reckon if Sharks didn't have that monster flight, it might be different. Um, But I think Toulouse have got enough to win that game and enough in the tank. And Larachelle Saracens, before last weekend, a lot of people maybe would have expected Larachelle to be heavy favourites. Saracens clearly have been in great form in the Premiership. Yeah. You know, struggled at times against Ospreys, but found a way through. So how do you see that one? I think, well, Larachelle have to be better. If they play the way they did last week, they'll lose. Um, Saracens are a team that are settled. They've got a way of playing that suits them. They've done it for 10, 15 years. They're very efficient. They're probably not as hardy as they were, and they've lost a little bit of their depth. Um, but La Rochelle, if they, the fundamental parts again, if they are decent up front, which they were, a big challenge for them will be line-out, actually. I think that might be key in this game and the Saracens have got a very effective line-out. La Rochelle, not so much. Um, but they have to hold on to ball. They have to test Saracens more than they tested and more effectively than the way they went about the business last weekend against Gloucester. 
I get my, I see that as really tight. Um, very similar to Toulouse Sharks in that the home teams and the away teams are very similar in style. Saracen Sharks, it's set piece oriented, kick, defense, squeeze. Um, I don't think La Rochelle are going to fall into the traps and be naive and play out from deep. I think they'll be pragmatic as well. Um, so I think, La, again, La Rochelle have to be better, but I see La Rochelle not by much, by a difference of five points, probably the same with Toulouse, a, a, a difference of one score in the two games, but two home wins. And you mentioned Saracens are a different prospect now to when they were winning Champions Cups before, for obvious reasons. But they've evolved the way they play as well. And so if they wanted to follow that Gloucester template of last week, they are less kick-oriented, less set-piece oriented, and they yeah. do offload the ball quite a lot and throw the ball around a bit more. So. Yeah the style point and the tactical point will be quite interesting in that one. Yeah, I, also personnel in that when you go back historically and obviously the salary cap scandal and everything that's gone with it, you look at Saracens unloading like a burger, a Brits, uh, you know, the names that would just roll off the tongue. That depth isn't there. So I think if you look at the two squads, La Rochelle have probably got a better bench as well. Um It'd be interesting for Big Will Skelton to be playing against his former team as well. I mean, those type of people and those collisions that were dominated previously by Saracens because they had a whole bunch of athletes. They're a little bit thinner on the ground now. So I think the Saracens are probably, they probably operate at a slightly higher level or have done consistently anyway over the past decade. But La Rochelle, now, if they get things right and they click, and Rog will have given them an absolute bollocking in the Monday morning review. Uh, and Mark McCall just saying as well, like, I wish La Rochelle had won by 50 last week. Gloucester have effectively poked a big old beast and they're going to come for us now. So you can see the motivations um, for both sides. But this is knockout rugby. It's huge rugby and Saracens have been here a million times before and done it. La Rochelle defending champions, but they were ridiculous last week um, in, a, in a fairly honest assumption. So La Rochelle to be much better to beat a Saracens team that will be incredibly hard to beat, but by the difference of one score. And we haven't spoken about the Challenge Cup at all, but a few French sides involved there in the quarterfinals, an all-French tie Toulon against Lyon, and also Clermont, who looked decent against Bristol, away at Scarlet's. They did, and do you know what? We talked last week about the approach that these sides would have in this competition. They all stuck out their first string, so mm. I was quite surprised in that I thought there'd be a lot of mixed squads put out and youth-tested because an emphasis would be in the top 14, but not at all. They all stuck their first sides out. Clermont, Damian Penno doing Damian Penno things. Um, an absolute phenomenon. For me, probably the best winger in the world. And for Christoph Urios, it's a good test in that maybe he's seen that top six is maybe out of sight now or out of reach, and therefore let's give this a real bash. And it's a decent chance to win some silverware for him with ultimately, what, 10 games in charge. Um And they went away last weekend, and they were superb in what they got through. You could see a little bit more of a settled squad more cohesion what they're trying to do, a little bit more organised and on the front foot because they have that level of organisation and detail that they didn't have previously with the old coaching team. So again, going to Scarlets, I expect them to overpower the Scarlets up front. Um, and you look at the work, for instance, Moala gets through in the midfield, the, the, the collisions he dominates, that creates a fair amount of space out in the flanks where he likes to Damian Penno. So I expect Claremont to win that one um, in Wales. And Toulon Leon a repeat of the final last year, obviously. Yeah. Um, unfortunately for Leon, they've picked up two big injuries this weekend. So Joshua Tuisova and Nini Ashvili, the Georgian, are both out. They both, I think it's either foot or ankle problems for both of them, ligament issues. They've already lost uh, Dylan Cretin and Jean-Marc Doussain. So like last year's champs, I thought they would have had a good chance going away from home, but considering how Toulon performed against Cheetahs at the weekend, they were again gone up. I'm not sure if it's the time of year, if it's knockout rugby that just sort of focuses everyone. I've got no idea, but again, their performance level went up dramatically the weekend. They blitzed the Cheetahs and blew them off the field. Um, so I'd expect Toulon to beat Leon quite comfortably, actually. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to David for joining us as well. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe, leave us a nice review if you can, check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube, and we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. We won't be back next week. Are we not? I'm on, I'm on holiday. <gasps> Bombshell. Shock. Shock horror. <laughs> See you in a couple of weeks. See you in two weeks. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Johnny. Bye.